Testing, welcome to CS4510, lecture 12A. Um, this is the most important class in, the most important lecture in the entire course. Not so much this first half of the A part, but the B part, 12B. You know, if you ever talk to old people or anything, uh, or like young adults who are like working and have careers or something, if they ever remember something from their computer science degree 20 years ago or whatever, it was, it's going to be uh, the topic of today's lecture. It's really, really important. And it's really the first result in computer science. It's the birth of computer science, uh, what we're talking about today, um, at least for the second part. The first part is just sort of the like precursor to that. Um, so we've been talking about um, uh, Hilbert's program and logical, uh, uh, trying to prove a foundation for all of mathematics. The topic of today's lecture, the title, excuse me, is going to be called Godel Incompleteness. Uh, Godel incompleteness, uh, we'll talk about what that means extensively. But basically, like, so where we are now, last time we talked about Russell's paradox. So Bertrand Russell used the axiom of unrestricted comprehension to derive an inconsistency in Frege's system. So you could prove that uh, y was in y if and only if uh, y was not in y. Um, Russell, like Hilbert and Frege and others, was a formalist. Uh, and basically, he wanted to build a foundation for all of mathematics, and he wanted he he was able to show that Frege had failed, and that Frege's system was not good because you could derive an inconsistency. But he wanted to build a good system. He wanted to build uh, a better system, so and a system that would serve as a foundation for all of mathematics. So he there's two ways that you could try and do this, and one of them. Uh, was done by other people, which is called the axiom of restricted comprehension. So recall, unrestricted comprehension basically means that you know anything that is a predicate, you can define that there exists a set to satisfy this. And it turns out this is too strong. This is exactly uh, the generality of this axiom is exactly what leads to like a fragility, and this is what in, uh, breaks the system. So instead, what you have is what's called restricted comprehension, which is it only allows you to define subsets. It, only, it doesn't allow you to, find, to, to just define any kind of set that you want, only sets that are subsets of other sets that have already been defined axiomatically. And it turns out this appears on the surface to be able to restrict uh, Russell's paradox. So this is called uh, restricted comprehension. So here, x is just any set. Here, x must be defined to be a subset of some other already defined set. And this explicitly allows um, avoidance of the de de defining the predicate like this. Right? You can't allow that now. So in the surface, it appears that it, it fixes this out. The other way is a the theory of types. Um, uh, the theory of types, basically, like, the, the whole problem with Russell's paradox is it appears to be self-reference. So uh, Russell was able to encode the sentence um, that was semantically equivalent to I am not true. He was able to encode this sentence using the formal language of uh, Frege's system, and the problem here is the fact that the, is, is the word I. So the sentence is able to say something about its own truth value, which should not be allowed. So he comes up with what's called this theory of types, and basically we have a bunch of levels, and each level I can only speak about level uh, like I minus one and less. So level I can speak about objects less than level I, strictly less. Level I minus one can speak about I minus two, and so on. And something like this is his system. And he wrote uh, Principia Mathematica. He spent, where, Rudge, where uh, Frege failed, uh, Russell tried to write, um, tried to succeed. So he wrote this, this several volume work called Principia Mathematica. Uh, Principia Mathematica, several books, three or six books, took him maybe over 20 years of his life to write this book, write these books. And it's nothing except axioms and the theory of types and proofs within the system of trying to prove you know, this is a good and foundational uh, axiomatic system. Uh, this was a huge and monumental effort, and it, took, it was basically his life's work. Uh, it took 20 years. You know, you only live for 70 years or something, so like that's two-sevenths of it. Is, do you know of any other thing that's called Principia Mathematica? Is there another thing you maybe know? Um, I think that's the name of Newton's thing where he founded calculus. So by naming it Principia or maybe Principia Mathematica, it's a big, you know, uh, lofty goals, basically. He wanted to put a book that would have uh, as a server as a foundation for all and all of mathematics. Um, 
Now, okay, fine, you can come up with any system you want, but it has to be a good system. So like, how do you, how do you ensure the system is good? Well, here's two, here's two definitions. Uh, completeness. So uh, an axiomatic system is complete if all uh, that is true is provable. Basically, uh, there is a correspondence between anything that is true and the anything that is provable. The idea is, if there is a theorem that is true, then there exists a proof of it, and then you can find this proof. So if there exists something that is true, there is a way for you to prove it. Uh, that's what it means for the axiomatic system to be complete, in the sense it, it, it encompasses everything, kind of like and maybe I've used this analogy too much, but like a vector space spans the whole area. A complete axiomatic system, if something is true, then it has to be provable. There's a proof towards that statement, to, towards that theorem. Uh, same thing as a, as a basis spanning the whole space. That's what it means for a system to be complete. Um, a system is consistent if uh, you uh, cannot prove... Uh, 0 equals 1. So basically, it's useful. It's basically, a, like, a, a completeness would just be nice if everything that was true is provable. And it, but it, consistency is a more, like, essential uh, feature. They're both very important, very essential. But certainly, I would rather have a consistent system that's incomplete than a complete system that's inconsistent. Because if you can prove 0 equals 1 within a system, then every theorem is both true and false simultaneously. And it's totally useless. It's complete garbage. You know, um, another way to say this is like for all statements p, uh, p and the negation of p is always false. Right? Both p and the, its opposite cannot both be true uh, simultaneously. So certainly that seems intuitive to our understanding of logic is that if something is true, its negation better be false. Uh, that's what it means for the system is to be consistent is that this is always false for every statement. So they spent a long time not just working through what makes good axioms, what makes simple axioms, but trying to prove uh, the consistency. They tried to prove the consistency of an axiomatic system. Um, one of the first challenges is to note that if Prince of P of Mathematica serves as a mathematical foundation for all of mathematics, it serves as a mathematical foundation for the mathematics they were doing, including the mathematics of them trying to prove the consistency. So what they're really trying to do is prove, like, Prince of P of Mathematica can derive as a theorem the consistency of Prince of P of Mathematica. That's really what they spent a lot of the bulk of the time on. They tried to prove that uh, from the system you can prove the consistency of the system. And here, con of PM is just consistency, a proof of the consistency in Prince P of Mathematica. And what this might look like is like somehow you were able to prove that you cannot prove 0 equals 1. So like assume to the contrary, you could prove 0 equals 1. Something bad happens. I don't know. Something like this is, is, is what happens. Um, uh, and notice that uh, this is what the lofty goal was. E, and this is exactly what uh, the opposite of what Russell was able to do to Frege. Re Russell was able to show that there was a consistency in Frege's system, and Russell hoped that his own system, spent 20 years working on, was uh, consistent. So uh, it turns out, though, that like the self-referential issue kind of seemed to be avoided uh, using this theory of types. Like you could not encode a sentence that was like Russell's paradox. You could not encode a sentence that said, "I am uh, not uh, true." This, it, it, there was some, in the technicalities, you were prevented from defining uh, sentences like this. However, Godel, this guy named Godel, who was also, so by this time Russell had aged, he was like 50s, uh, this young guy named Godel came along, and he noticed a huge, huge groundbreaking result. And it's the fact that you don't need sentences to talk about their own truth value to drive an inconsistency. You can simply have them uh, talk about their own provability. So instead, he derives a sentence, I am not Provable. That's Godel's sentence. Uh, what does that mean? So first off, if a statement is provable, if there exists a proof of a statement, it's true. It seems obvious. 
But when we're talking about if a system is complete or consistent, the word true and the word provable, that we have to, because we call them different things, there has to be a slight difference between them. And Godel was able to show that although you could prevent a statement from talking about its own truth value, you could never prevent a statement from talking about its own provability. And this was uh, a groundbreaking result. And the conclusion here, basically, he showed uh, that you could not prove uh, that Principia of Mathematica or any related system was both consistent and complete simultaneously. You can't, you can't prove it, basically, is what he said. Um, and your life's, and, uh, you know, he called Russell, uh, you know, you're a loser, and your life's work is in vain, and I'm only 22, something like this. Obviously, he didn't say that. Godel, very weird guy in his own right, very odd, uh, odd man. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's, not, it's not nice to know that you've been working towards something for 20 years, and someone proves uh, that it's false. Uh, on their first try, like it's a, what you were what you were looking to prove could not uh, could not be shown. So the idea of the proof is extremely simple, but the difficulty that Godel entails is the fact that he has to be able to have systems talk about their own provability. That's really the difficulty here. So the formal statement of Godel's first incompleteness theorem is this: Godel's first. I was wrong. It was 11 minutes. Uh, theorem. Uh, basically, any uh, axiomatic system with sufficient arithmetic cannot both be complete and consistent. The better way to word this is like, if a system is consistent, then it is incomplete. Any complete, any consistent axiomatic system will be incomplete. Um, so what does sufficient arithmetic mean? So that I don't want to, you can get very, very formal about what the it defines to means. For us, it means that there exists two, you can define two relations, and it turns out that's sufficiently as, as if you could define within your system multiplication and addition. Uh, if you, you can have toy axiomatic systems that are very small and useless that happen to be consistent and complete um, because they're very weak on purpose. But if there is a system strong enough to encapsulate most of mathematics, all of mathematics, uh, then it necessarily contains sufficient arithmetic and necessarily cannot be consistent and complete. So uh, the proof of this is really, um, like, there's much more baggage involved with getting statements to talk about provability than there is the idea of the proof itself. So basically, Godel has to come up with something we now call a Godel numbering. Basically, like, you and I don't talk about this anymore because we know all objects can be represented by strings because we interact with computers on a daily basis and everything is a file. You have a music, it's a file. You have... Um, and what is a file but a sequence of ones and zeros, which is just a string, right? Every object that you and I deal with uh, conceptually is a file. This was new to these guys at the time, so he comes up with this idea of a Godel numbering. And all he does is, so these are systems that, dealing, that, are, that deal with arithmetic. These are systems that deal with numbers, natural numbers. They're not systems that deal with statement provability. So somehow he has to talk about statements talking about themselves in a system that's designed for numbers. So what he does is first he assigns uh, a Godel numbering is simply a function which assigns what we now call strings to the natural numbers. The way he does this is with like the following table. So I claim this is like, um, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to call it x and t of x, but this is like, uh, uh, what are the symbols in a system? They're going to be zero. There's going to be the successor function. There's going to be the negation. Symbol, there's going to be the or, there's the uh, universal quantifier, an open parenthesis, and a closed parenthesis. Uh, and to these, he assigns the numbers uh, 1, 3, 5, uh, 7, 9, 11, and 13. And for any of uh, uh, free variables, he assigns them uh, primes to be. Uh, greater than 13. So this is going to be 17, and this is going to be 19. So 
basically, to each symbol of, uh, that can be part of a valid statement, he assigns to them a number first. Yes? What's the one underneath seven? A universal quantifier. No, 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 on the right. Under. 19. Oh, 11. Why is, why is it 11? 9. Oh, okay. There we go. <laughs> so, um, these are all primes. And this is a, 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 well, these are the primes. This is a, a choice that actually turns out it doesn't matter. And then he, what he does is he uh, basically assigns each um, uh, as follows. He says that gamma of x is equal to the product of pi to the ti, uh, txi, from i equals 1 to k uh, for, like, x is equal to x1 xk. Right. So what he does is he raises, uh, he just he uses uh, a prime encoding, basically, for the string. So this is going to be a number, but it takes as input a string. Okay? Godel basically has never seen a computer in his life. He has to reinvent a computer. This is super obvious. We don't do this anymore, obviously. We just say the string of the thing. Okay, obviously, if I ask you to convert uh, strings to numbers, you could do that. Just cast it or sort it or something. But he has to come up with a way to do that. He has to come up with an operation to represent string concatenation and all kinds of crazy things. Um, to give you an example, like uh, the, the gamma of, let's say, the string uh, for all x, uh, x or the negation of x, right? Um, so what is this? This is the excluded middle. Either x or the negation of x is true and it's quantified over x. Uh, this would be represented by the number uh, 2 to the, and then, so the for all is a 9. So it's 2 to the 9, 3 to the x, which is 17, 5 to the parenthesis, which is 11. I'll just finish it out. 7 to the 17, 11 to the 7, uh, 13 to the 5, uh, 17 to the 17, and 19 to the 13, right? So big number, huge number, massive number. It's really ugly, and it's not really, uh, like, you, I wouldn't want to expand that and write it down. Um, problem, uh, the point of doing this, though, is he gets to use the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that if two numbers are the same, then certainly the strings are the same, right? If two numbers are the same, they have the same prime divisors, then each symbol is the same for them. Right, so convince yourself that like uh, phi of x, excuse me, phi, uh, gamma of x equals gamma of y, it implies that x equals y. And here equals is in a string um, way, and here equals is in a num numerical way, right? Uh, and certainly the reverse uh, is also obviously true. So this is a sort of a, it's not necessarily a bijection from the strings to the naturals, because there are many strings which are not uh, valid logical statements. So here's a way he converts s logical statements, as we're talking about them, strings, into um, numbers. Now, the point of this is he gets to now use number theory to talk about certain facts of numbers. So, for example, like, let's say, like, if you know that Pij uh, divides gamma of x and, like, P i to the j plus 1 does not divide gamma of x, right? Suppose you were able to derive something like that. You know that the, j th the, the, the power of pi in the number was j and not j plus 1. You could tell something about x just from looking at the number theory. So using number theory, he's able to derive what is basically basic string operations for us. We know, we can look at a symbol. Like, how do you know if a symbol starts with an existential or universal quantifier? You check if there's a negation before it, right? Also, notice we didn't have to define several symbols. We didn't have to define the existential quantifier or an and, because these are, it turns out, are universal enough. He's chose a specific set of numbers, but it, it doesn't really matter, right? You could do, you can convert any existential statement to a negation for all, right? So... How would we check if a statement is, a universal, is universally quantified? You just look at the symbol. Here, he has to do some really complicated math to talk about the same thing. You know, he has to have this overwhelming power. Basically, he, he has to invent a computer to do what we, uh, what we really, really take for granted uh, every day. And doing so, he 
comes up with 40 formula. He comes up with, excuse me, 46 different formula. And two of them, I'm not going to go through all 46 formula. It's unnecessary. He's reinventing a computer, basically, by doing this. But he comes up with the following two uh, formula, which are important to me. Uh, so for all x, y, which are numbers, uh, we say x demonstrates y. Um, and I'll separate this a little bit. If... Uh, the object represented by the number x is a proof of uh, the object represented by the number y. So first off, dem here is a relation. This is a relation is just any kind of uh, it takes two objects or you can an n, n, n object and returns true or false, right? So like you could say x equals y, that's a relation, x greater than less than equal to y. These are always true or false, right? So here, dem is just a relation. And it takes him 46 formula and several pages to define dem as a relation, but it's correct and true. So basically, x is a number and y is a number, but it's only a number. This relation is only true if x is a number, but it's represented, it's, an, it's a number which represents some object, some proof, basically. And this relation is only true if x is a proof of y. Technically, I should be saying the inverse of gamma, the, the object which was represented by number x is a proof of the object represented by number y. But it, this conflation is really one that's specific to his time and not necessary to us. We can just kind of shorthand and, and be lazy here and say that this relation is true if the object x is a proof of object y, right? This is what this relation means, dem. Dem is for demonstrate. So x demonstrates y. Uh, another relation he defines much earlier, this is like relation, this is the last one, this is the, the important one. This is uh, number 46, I think this is one is like 20. For all x, uh, v, uh, y in the naturals, uh, we define the relation x uh, sub uh, and v, y. And a relation need not have only two uh, parts. It doesn't need to be binary. The notation becomes a little worse because you can't write it like this, okay? But we're going to write two of them on one side, okay? So basically, if uh, b is a free variable in uh, x, replace it with y. So y could be a string of some other symbols. It's actually a number, but, you know, Basically, what you do is you divide out wherever you see this x and multiply in by this, right? If you think about the prime ba by the prime basis again, if we wanted to change this x to a y, what would we do? We would find x is 17. So this is the x, and this is the x. We would divide out by the powers of 17, and then multiply in back by the powers of 19. If we wanted to change this x and x to a y to a y, right? The sub here stands for substitute. So again, he's doing something very complicated for something that's really easy to us. If I ask you to substitute in a string into a free variable, easy, right? Put three into f of x. That's easy, right? Like you could easily define like f of x uh, sub x three, right? And this gives you what? f of three. Substitution. Very simple, obvious thing. He needs to define it. And he uses it to define the other 46 formula, but this is uh, one of his first ones. So... Using these two relations, and this is what you need sufficient arithmetic for, given sufficient arithmetic, you can define these operations. Uh, I don't want to get too detailed on how you define them, but we can suppose that we have these two basic operations. That's all we need. So consider, uh, first consider the statement, um, there does not exist... P such that uh, P uh, demonstrates X. So again, it's just a valid logical statement over the symbols we've defined so far. We have a dem, we have a demonstrates relation. Uh, there does not exist P such that P demonstrates X. Basically, what this says is that X is not provable, right? So I'm going to write it out logically and correctly, but then I'm also going to explain, like in English, what this means. What does this really say in English? X is not provable. Right? If there does not exist P such that P is a proof of X, there does not exist a proof of X. So if there does not exist a proof of X, X is not provable. It doesn't say anything about its truth, but it does say it's not provable. 
Now, consider the formula of a single uh, free variable. So f of x is equal to there does not exist p, such that uh, p is a proof of uh, x, but we substitute uh, the string x for the value x. Okay, complicated formula, but certainly allowed to be defined, okay? There does not exist P such that P is a proof of, and then whatever this is, and whatever that is, is we take X, we substitute anytime we see a 17, which is X, the string X, the free variable X in X, which is just X, with the value X, and X here is also just a different formula. Uh, seems kind of ridiculous that you're allowed to do this, but sure, it's fine. Now, this is a formula like any other object. It's just a formula. It's a thing, okay? So you can have a Godel numbering of this formula. This number has a Godel numbering, okay? Like every object has a Godel numbering. So does this function. This function of one free variable has a Godel numbering, okay? So gamma of f is just a number. Like any other. Okay, it's just some number. Gamma of f exists, though. We agree on that. What happens if you evaluate f at gamma of f? So what is uh, f evaluated at gamma of f? So to be clear here, f is a function. Here it's being treated like a string, and then we convert the string to a number. Then we evaluate this formula on a number happens to be evaluated on the number that represents its own code. Fine. But we're going to evaluate the function at the number which represents itself. Okay? So what I'm going to do is just quite literally syntactically replace this. Anytime we see an x, what happens when you evaluate a function? Anytime you see an x, you just put that, you put that number in wherever the x appears. Okay? So what is this? Uh, there does not exist p such that p demonstrates uh, gamma of f, uh, substitute uh, 17 with gamma of f. Okay. Second line, all I've done is a, is a syntactic uh, replacement. Any questions on this part so far? Anything unclear? All I've done here is taken the, fu the function, and I've substituted in gamma of f. Okay? So anytime I saw an x, there's now a gamma of f. That's quite literally what it is. Okay? Um, this is kind of messy, though. So let's try and simplify this. This part here seems messy, so I'm going to simplify this first. Right? Then we can have something maybe here, and then it's just the demonstrate. That should be obvious. So what is gamma of f? If we substitute in, anytime we see a 17, which is an x, we, we replace that with gamma of f. Right, so let's just kind of look at the sub-formula. What, what is this worked out? Okay. The substitute arithmetic operation looks at this as a number, but it actually replaces things in the formula for the number. So it's going to operate on f. And anytime there's a 17 and x appears in f, it's going to replace it with gamma of f. Okay, well, we know f. Let's just take f, manually replace every time there appears an x, and replace it with gamma of f. So we have f. f is here. I'm going to replace everything anytime 17 appears in f and replace it with gamma of f. That's going to be there, there does not exist p such that p is a proof of. Uh, Gamma of f, substitute, and there's the last one, 17, uh, gamma of f. OK, so we actually didn't simplify it. It turns out we made it slightly more complicated. We worked out the sub part of the formula, and we got the same thing. What, did, what, what is this? Did you notice? This 
is exactly the same as this. We took a part of the formula, expanded it, and got the same thing as the original formula. This is exactly the same sequence of symbols as this. Okay? And quite literally, if you think about it, this substitutes every time there's an x, it replaces the x in f with gamma of f. That's the same thing as if we had done this. f replaces the x with gamma of f, right? So we use the substitution routine here as an evaluation. We could have just written this to begin with. Any questions on this? This is the, kind of the crux of the proof here. Confu it's crazy that's possible. So basically, what happens is, is we can replace this part, which expands to be the same thing, with gamma of f. f of gamma of f, right? So to rewrite the whole thing, we have, I'm going to rewrite this line. We have uh, f of gamma of f is equal to, there does not exist p such that p is a proof of f of gamma of f. Any questions on this step? I notice that we, we take uh, gamma of f and we substitute the 17 with gamma of f. We get back just f of gamma of f. Okay? And then this is the following sentence that we've simplified down so far. Any questions? Should we be going slow? Now, uh, here's really the, the, the part of the kicker. This is kind of complicated, but f of gamma and uh, f now appears on both sides. That's kind of the crux. I'm just going to call uh, f of gamma of f I'm just going to call that G for Godel, for simplicity. I can rename variables. So we get G is equal to there does not exist P, such that P demonstrates G. OK? Agreed that I haven't made any illogical jumps. Nothing is wrong. OK? In English, what does this sentence say? G is Yes, G is not, not only is G unprovable, but G says G is unprovable. Oh, right. So in English, this says I am not provable. So although Russell's system of types may have been able to prevent talking about truth, it cannot prevent you from talking about provability as long as you can define this demonstrates relation, which is not easy. It's very mechanical. We don't want to show how you do it, but... If you can talk about this, you can use a trick like this to get a sentence to talk about its own provability. We have now constructed a sentence G that says, I am not provable. We have two cases. So G exists, OK? I'll put it here. Um, assume. We are working in a complete and consistent axiomatic system. So G is either true or false. So notice that f had a free variable of x, but when we evaluated f at its own numbering, it no longer has a free variable. This is not a function, a formula anymore. This is simply a statement. And if we are working in a complete and consistent axiomatic system, then every statement has a truth value. The truth value of the formula is dependent upon what you evaluate it at, of course. But this has a truth value because it has no free variables. So what is the truth value of g? So we have two cases. Case one. G is true. So if G is true, G, G is so we get to assume G is true in this case. If G is true, G says, I am not provable. So G is true, but not provable. OK, well, congrats. We have a true. unprovable statement. Therefore, our system could not be complete.
right? Complete, recall the definition of a complete axiomatic system. Completeness means all that is true is provable. If something is true, there exists a proof of it. Um, consistent means that there, there does not exist a proof of 0 equals 1. Uh, if G is true, G is true but not provable. So we have a true but unprovable statement. So we are incomplete. Uh, case two. Uh, well, okay, maybe G isn't true. We reach a contradiction. Maybe G is false. Uh, so G is false. What is G? G being false means that the negation of G is true. If something is false, then its negation has to be true, right? If it's a statement with no free variables. Uh, what, is, what is the negation of G? So the negation of G is equal to there does not exist, there does not exist uh, P such that P demonstrates G, right? So I've quite literally taken G and then just negated the front of it as we defined. Okay, fine. There's a negation, negation here. Cancel those out. Uh, there does exist P such that P demonstrates G. Okay, so there does exist P such that P demonstrates G. There exists, G is provable. If a statement is provable, it's true. So we observe that the negation of G being, so we observe that G being false implies that the negation of G is true, which implies that G is true. So G is false implies that G is true. Of course that can't happen, right? We are inconsistent. So this is really completes the proof of uh, Gödel's inc first incompleteness theorem. He is able to construct this sentence that says, I am not provable. And then if it's true, then we are not assumed to the contrary. We are working in a complete and consistent axiomatic system. So the system is good and strong and has all the features we want. If it is good and strong enough, I can always create a sentence called that says, I am not provable as a semantic paradox. If it's true, then it's unprovable. If it's false, then it's true, and we are inconsistent. You have a statement which is both true and false simultaneously. So using this, he basically defeated uh, Russell. Russell, Hilbert, and others. He was able to show that any system that could hope to be strong enough can talk about itself, no matter how you try to avoid it. This is not The only things that were specific here to Russell's system, unlike Frege's system, where Russell's paradox broke a specific axiom in Frege's system. Okay? Nothing here appeared to be specific about Russell's theory of types. I'm not, I didn't ignore Russell's theory of types because it's long and insane, but it's unnecessary. This proof works for any strong enough or consistent axiomatic system. The only part that was really dependent upon uh, Russell's system is the choice of these numbers, which really doesn't matter. Right? He saves the even numbers and uh, higher numbers and other things for types uh, of things. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the fact that you're allowed to do this at all is really, you know, it's crazy. So Gödel is this young guy, and he publishes his paper and on his first incompleteness there. And he, and he defeats, you know, no one thought this was possible. No one thought you could have a system. You can construct a statement which was true but unprovable. Everyone thought that you could rigorously build a foundation for mathematics. And he showed, actually, uh, you can't, because you can always construct an unprovable statement. Um, here's the... Here's the uh, a, a huge question. What is the name of this proof technique? Is it, it is diagonalization. Russell diagonalized over sets. He said he had some set talk about its own, whether it contains itself or not. This is simply a proof of diagonalization over the logical formulas. Why? Well, we have a negation. 
we have some quote unquote uh, like fixed point or diagonal, and that's where G is on both sides of the equation. That's as if there's like the I, I elements of the diagonal. Here, suppose we lined up all the elements, row and column, row and column. The diagonal would appear uh, when the statements are talking about itself, and G happens to be this specific statement, right? So uh, it's, a neg it's self referential, like the diagonalization argument is. There is a negation, like the diagonalization is, and there is some sort of diagonal. There. It's not apparent why the diagonalization is there without drawing the table. But perhaps you can believe that this is nothing ex if not a proof by diagonalization. Um, Russell really hoped to avoid diagonalization in his system. Godel showed it's unavoidable. So uh, one more uh, comment on, the, on diagonalization is that when you do a proof by diagonalization, you construct, quote unquote, a diagonal element that exists for no other purpose than to be a counterexample, right? Same, same thing with this this formula, right? So Russell defined a set that doesn't contain itself. Fine. It's useless, though, except for the fact that it doesn't contain itself. That's the only point of it. Uh, Godel here does, the, the constructs a formula, which is also useless, except for the fact that it doesn't contain itself. So in the same sense, the, the, the diagonal uh, is the same here. Now, this was only... This was only uh, made worse by uh, Godel's second incompleteness theorem, which is actually a very simple corollary of the first. So Godel's first incompleteness theorem said there cannot exist an axiomatic system that if it is complete, if it is consistent, which is the bare minimum, we better hope it's consistent. If it's consistent, then it's incomplete, really. Um, Godel's second incompleteness theorem uh, is a simple corollary. No uh, axiomatic system is capable of proving its own consistency. So while Godel's first incompleteness theorem says you can never show that, the, that the, any such system you build will always be incomplete. You'll never be able to show that all that is true must also be provable. It will always be deficient in some way. Fine, OK? Can you, use, can you still sh at least show that your system is useful, if not total? Fine, you can't show it's total. Can it still be useful? Can you prove that your system does not contain uh, a contradiction? And so recall that consistency means that there is no proof that 0 equals 1, right? So. Uh, for a system proving its own consistency, we would mean like the axiomatic system, in this case, Principia Pria Mathematica or, or other related systems, can produce a proof of the consistency of Principia Mathematica, right? So some set of axioms, and if the axioms are big enough that they encompass all of mathematics, you naturally have to be working within that set of axioms, can, with you within the, these set of axioms, produce a proof that you cannot prove 0 equals 1 within the axioms. Godel says you cannot. Any axiomatic system is incapable of proving its own consistency. And um, if the system is big enough that you are working within it, then there cannot exist a proof of the consistency of the axiomatic system. Um, there are very small toy systems that you can prove consistency of, but only in the sense that you're using techniques that are outside of the system. Like imagine you have a very simple childlike logical system that I don't know, only has 0 and 1 defined, and like you're very, very limited in some sense. No multiplication, maybe only addition, Boolean, I don't know. You could probably prove it's consistent because it's unca there's only, maybe there's only finally many proofs or something. And to prove that such a system is consistent would require proof techniques that are outside of the system that are not encapsulated by the system. So certainly, uh, it's not saying you can, can never prove the consistency of the system, but it proves certainly that Russell you know, was a loser. Like, he spent his life's work trying to prove the cons consistency of the of Principia Mathematica, and Godel showed that no such proof basically could exist. The proof is, is, is relatively simple. Uh, suppose uh, there did exist a proof. Such a proof. Um, note in, uh, that in the first incompleteness theorem, in the construction of G, we assumed, uh, to the contrary, uh, 
that the axiomatic system was complete and consistent. So replace the consistency assumption by uh, a proof of the consistency of the system. So your con axiomatic system is a, is a, is, is a statement that asserts the axiomatic system is consistent. Um, when we built G, G was built assuming consistency, right? So just replace the assumption of consistency by a proof of the consistency, right? Um, so then we get that, simply put, we get that the consistency of the axiomatic system implies G. So if there did exist a proof of the axiomatic system, we could, of course, create a sentence like G, and then we have the same issue again. So if you could prove the consistency of the axiomatic system, unfortunately, you can construct G and all the problems that come with the statement G. Well, so if you could, if you could prove the consistency of the axiomatic system, then uh, if, if, this, if the consistency of the axiomatic system is proved true, then P implies Q, G is true. If G is true, then we are incomplete. Right. So same issues happen. So this is kind of a uselessly uh, complete axiomatic system. Excuse me, a useless, the, the sentence global constructed appears to be a uselessly uh, constructed sentence. But there are, quote unquote, useful sentences which appear uh, unprovable. So it was a big part of early research that came after this period of the following statement, which is the continuum hypothesis. And roughly, it says, like, um, uh, there does not exist uh, some set S such that the cardinality of the set is strictly, uh, I'll put the naturals here, is strictly between uh, cardinalities of countable and uncountable. So what is this statement saying? Uh, there does not exist a set S such that the cardinality of the set S comes between the naturals and the power set of the naturals, right? We prove that the naturals have a countably infinite number of elements. Uh, the power set of the naturals are uncountable. They are strictly greater, okay? Is this ordering between countable and uncountable like kind of like the naturals or kind of more like the rationals? Because you recall between any two rationals, there exists a rational, right? It's um, dense. Does this ordering of the uncountable, and of course the power set of the power set of the naturals goes beyond. Is there something between these two? And it turns out um, the answer is really complicated. So uh, in uh, 1940, uh, Gödel proved that uh, following the axioms of ZFC, and ZFC is the set of axioms that we use today, they're a modern and conservative set of axioms for set theory. Uh, they feel like they're written by lawyers, and they're a pretty good choice of axioms, much better of a choice than Principia Mathematica. There's only like eight axioms. Um, and this stands for Zermelo, Franknell, and the axiom of choice. You've heard of the axiom of choice. Um, basically, he proved that um, following the axioms of ZFC, you could not prove the negation of the continuum hypothesis. Um, you, you, could not, you could not derive the negation of the continuum hypothesis as a theorem from ZFC. And then in 1963, this guy named Paul Cohen uh, proved that from the axioms of ZFC, you could not prove uh, the continuum hypothesis. So... Together, what do these really say about the continuum hypothesis? If you cannot prove the continuum hypothesis, and you cannot disprove the continuum hypothesis, uh, then you cannot prove or disprove it any way. You can't, it doesn't really lead you one way or another if the continuum hypothesis is true or false. 
What that really means is you can take the continuum hypothesis as an axiom with no consequence, essentially. You, you will get two different models of set theory, but like whether you assume there exists a set that is in between the two cardinalities or you assume there doesn't exist a set between the two cardinalities, the consequence is, is small, essentially. There's no, there's no, it doesn't really matter. There's nothing that really changes whether or not you can prove or disprove the continuum, uh, if the continuum hypothesis is true or false. It took Paul Cohen, he had to invent this whole new technique called forcing. Uh, and the proof is not beyond you, but it would take an entire semester. Like, he has a textbook, and the whole course is just, you end on proving, you go through all the incompleteness terms and so on, and you end on the proof of the continuum hypothesis. And for this work, he earned a Fields Medal in, like, uh, 1964. It's the only Fields Medal I know. Um, it's the only Fields Medal I know that has been awarded for logic. So... Also important here is that neither model of uh, the set theory that you derive gets a um, inconsistency, right? You can assume it or it's negation, just fine. You'll, you'll never derive zero equals one. So there is no hint to whether it is true or false. I told you we would return to this book, uh, Logic Comics. Um, last time we talked about how Russell discovered Russell's paradox uh, somewhere in there. So there's Fred's system, his notation. Um, there's Fred, he's talking to him. There's Cantor, he's going crazy. He, he, there's him, he's wrecked the foundations of mathematics. It's really dramatic. He's like screaming and crying and pissing everywhere. Um, there's some crazy stuff that goes on. We talked about the, the barbershop analogy. Here's him writing. Here's him deciding to write Principia Mathematica. Uh, let's see. There's some other stuff going along. He moves in. That's Whitehead. So this is Russell and Whitehead. Russell moves into Whitehead's house and spends the next 12 years trying to write Principia Mathematica. Spends maybe 20 trying to prove its consistency. Here's kind of the timeline what happens. Mathematics must be based on logic. Uh, Fridge creates the right logic based on sets. He finds a paradox, logic is faulty, and Whitehead and I must fix it, and that's what Principia is, or Principia. And so the point is to put mathematics on a rigorous foundation. And there's also kinds of other drama that happens in the book. You know, he moves into this guy's house and he starts sleeping with his wife, and then you know, it's, uh, some dramatic stuff happens. So he submits it to the thing, it's all these volumes, and it's full of symbolic notation, and nobody can read it, nobody understands what's going on. So it's actually rejected from the printing the first time, no one wants to pay for it. And then here's, uh, here's Godel as a little, little child, little, small, weird adult. Um, let's see. There's some World War I going on. I, had some I thought I had some pages bookmarked. Is this the right? Oh, well, close enough. So basically, uh, here's the announcement of, Godel, of Godel's results. Basically, like the way the actual story worked and it wasn't fictionalized is that Hilbert gave this address. He gave his retirement speech at this conference, and he ended the speech with uh, an assertion that the Hilbert's program would succeed and that we would find a complete and consistent axiomatic system, and we would be able to prove it's complete and consistent, and this would encapsulate all of mathematics, and our job would be done. Um, and then on the third day of the conference, like in a little corner, this young Kurt Gödel announced his results, uh, and only one person paid attention to him, and that was von Neumann. It's a little dramatized the way it's presented here. So, um, let's see. At this point, I returned to logic, where I was experimenting with education logicians based on Principia, reached the apex of the struggle towards my youthful dream. To build mathematics on absolute certainty, to the place the lowest of the beastly things on granite foundations. There's this turtle analogy. And uh, yes, without abstract language of Principia, this would have been a pipe dream. Though I still felt, personally, that I had failed. And so it's kind of interjecting between the author's writing this graphic novel and Bertrand Russell supposedly speaking this, and that's, that's um, Papa Dimitriou. 
Uh, true to the spirit of his Paris talk of 1900 that had also inspired me so much, David Hilbert continued to preach the struggles of the high priest as the high priest. Uh, he spread his message by every means available, including the newest technology of the radio. With the tools of the new logic, we shall at last cement the cornerstone of our science, the provability of every mathematical statement or its negation. So there's Hilbert, and he's making his little address. Never for the pessimistic ignoramus, our battle cry is, never ignoramus. We must know, we shall know. So if you know, I had this little patch on my jacket. It's unfortunate it's summer, so I don't get to wear it. That's what the quote of Hilbert says, and it's basically like famous last words. His message had inspired, among others, a recent acquaintance of mine who was to be, so there's Godel, weird little guy, weird little glasses, probably one of the only five people in the world to ever have read Principia Mathematica, and they were all critical of it. He's the one here, and he's the one who basically shut it down. Here, he's reading the five volumes on his book, on his desk. Uh, who was to be a speaker at the next logical conference held right inside the, the lair of the Vienna Circle. Hello, Schlick, have you discovered Wittgenstein's true age yet? Ha ha, he returns to Vienna soon, will be, will observe empirically. I present a brilliant long, uh, young colleague, her, Dr. von Neumann, and honor her professor. So I guess this guy here with the smirk is, is von Neumann. Say, I wonder how you chaps can, can like me and Wittgenstein, especially given our differences on mathematics. Maybe the next speaker will settle matters in your favor. Rumor has it he solved Hilbert's second problem, the consistency and completeness of arithmetic, and thus all of mathematics. My goodness gracious. It's hard to exaggerate the feeling of his excited anticipation as Kurt Gödel began his talk. Her professor, Hilbert and Russell, distinguished colleagues, I will speak to you of, he's a Platonist, light years from Wittgenstein, uh, my research on the provability of the propositions of arithmetic. Like you, he believes logic is an image of the highest form of truth. So, you know, Ron Doyman's being rude, he's talking during the talk. The powerful methods of the Principia for, for now allow us, for the first time in history, to speak of correctly formulated question in theories of mathematics. And thus, further to ask, is a correctly formulated mathematical question necessarily answerable? And there's Hilbert with his little hat, his trademark hat. He says, obviously. In other words, is every mathematical statement provable? Either the statement itself, or if it states something that's false, it's opposite. It is the most fundamental question that I have found the answer, which is no. Or to put it differently, there will always be unanswerable questions. And there's a surprise in the audience. Whoa. Right? Uh, or her doctor, surely you, you, surely you mean unanswered questions, Ja? No, no. Since the scope of truth is infinite, there will always be unanswered questions. What I mean now was precisely this, unanswerable. What I have proved, in essence, is that arithmetic, and thus also the, any system based on it, is, is of necessity incomplete. In Godel's lecture, the audience had expected the confirmation of, the word, of their most cherished vision. So he goes, so, so Gen R is not provable, for if it were, there would be an end such that, uh, and they got something completely different. It's all over. You can kind of see some of Godel's notations from his original paper. Right There's a 17. Bu there, I think, means is a proof of, so what, what we were using for demonstrates. So he's doing some substitution with uh, 17 Gen R and, and so on. And it's a little, his proof is actually a little archaic and old. All over. Von Neumann's comment perfectly sums up the essence of Gödel's proof. I know it may be hard for laypersons to understand, but for, the, for, for a lot of very intelligent people, the incompleteness theorem was the end of a dream. The dream that had, had theological ancestry, it had credo, its credo had been written in Greek two and a half millennia ago. And now suddenly the rug had been pulled from under the feet of the dreamers. Her professor would be like to take you to your hotel. That is the beauty of the terror of mathematics. There is no getting around a proof, even, it's, even if it proves that something is unprovable. It's all over, eh? Well, it was von Neumann's uh, first reaction, but things turned out very differently. The journey through abstract thought from Aristotle via Boole all the way to Gödel's theorem in Ephens led to a new beginning, which... Look, before you think of the new beginnings, has their series has ended the complete. So it doesn't end good for these guys. I'll just show you a preview. Like, they're all, you know, Jewish and uh, part of the intelligentsia, and this is pre-war Nazi Germany, right? So there's some terrible things that go on in the book. It doesn't, there's no happy ending for anyone in this story. But um, uh, that's basically the finale of the, of the graphic novel. I, I spoiled it for you guys. So, um, yeah, that's uh, Gödel's Incompleteness Theorem. When we come back from the talk, we'll talk about uh, the work of Alan Turing and the foundation of computer science.